Before I begin this list ranking SS Rajamouli's films, it's important to understand what kind of a filmmaker I think he is. Therefore, you can understand how I'm rating the stories he tells and the criteria I've used and avoided. There's a certain outlandishness to Rajamouli's films that people are never able to comprehend. Why is it that two decades and 12 films later you're still finding yourself whistling at the moments he creates? Even if most of us sometimes feel we're above masala films, what separates him from the other big mainstream filmmakers of his era? I think the answer lies in the fact that Rajamouli is not just India's biggest director, but he's also India's biggest teller of folk tales. He's not just trying to root his films in realism, but he's trying to land them on regular emotions of storytelling such as love, anger, revenge, justice, and then take them to an exaggerated space folk tales exist in. It's not enough to say the villain was ferocious. It has to be, he is such a bad guy, he could beat a wild bull with his bare fist and bring it down without breaking into a sweat. Rajamouli excels compared to his contemporaries because he's not asking the question of whether good will win over evil. Everyone knows who will win, but it's how they win and what they lose that matters. That is important to Rajamouli and that is where his methods cause such madness among viewers. Each movie is being ranked by how well Rajamouli achieves this with a focus on how such an idea is brought to life. In 12th position is of course his debut film Student No. 1. It's no surprise that Rajamouli's debut is his weakest film. Even though one can see that there are hints of what's going to come from him in that thrilling interval twist when NTR Jr. reveals that when he goes home, actually he is going to the city central jail, it's a stunning revelation that shocks you and sets up what should be a fantastic second half. But the problem is that the flashback never really delivers on the punch the first half promises. NTR Jr., who was all of 16 and his voice is barely cracked in this film, tries his best to shoulder the emotion of a student who wants to achieve his father's dreams of becoming a lawyer, but he's far too young to carry the second half. Only in the end does Rajamouli have a Rajamouli-esque sequence where NTR emerges from fire, being literally on fire himself. Here, NTR Jr. is more comfortable with this depiction of heroism, even though it's way beyond his years. Barring a few ideas, which only a few translate, the film itself feels amateurish and is clearly Rajamouli's poorest film. The 11th placed film on this list is Yamadonga. I'm prepared for all the hate I'm going to get from NTR Jr.'s fans, but this one is easily Rajamouli's weakest story. It's odd that Rajamouli reserved his weakest story for NTR Jr., whom he considers his favorite actor. Rajamouli has rarely delivered linear films without giving a flashback or giving his leading men the chance to play two characters. He always tries to ensure both stories have equal importance or at least his protagonists die at the altar of having clear goals and having many obstacles in their path. But in this film, it is obvious that Rajamouli is itching to get to the segments involving hell and show us the confrontation between Yama and Raja. He constantly breaks the rules of his universe when he needs to propel the dull screenplay forward. And this is the only film where all the lead actors have saved Rajamouli rather than the other way around. And once the portions in hell are done, they're, and they're over much sooner than you would have liked them. Yamudanga delves into cliches and melodrama unlike what you expect from Rajamouli. The 10th placed film in this list is Simhadri. First and foremost, I know this film is a fan favourite and established the legendary status of NTR Jr. as a superstar in Telugu cinema at the age of 19. This film is one of those where NTR Jr. again saves Rajamouli with his commitment to the slightly oafish but highly principled titular character who believes in the utilitarian idea that one must be ready to die or kill if it benefits a larger group. There are elements that exhibit why Rajamouli respects masala moments and tries his best to imagine them with freshness. But Simhadri has not aged well despite many such adrenal pumping moments in the second half. Rajamouli has always used the torture of women and children as a way to amp up villainism, but nowhere is it uglier than in Simhadri. It feels excessive, unnecessary given that the initial portions of courting between Simhadri and the heroine seem equally crass. Ninth placed in this list is Chhatrapati. No other film of Rajamouli feels as uneven as Chhatrapati. And that's primarily because of how much story and masala Rajamouli packs into the first half. The first half has such great moments that it culminates into what is modern Telugu cinema's massiest interval block that hasn't been beaten to date. Kiravani's score, Prabhas's commitment to the part, the way Sandil Kumar's camera celebrates the star's physique and the performance of other actors like Shafi, LB Sriram, Kota Srinivas, Ravan Shekhar leaves you worried that you might be hospitalized if the second half has more such chest-thumping moments. Thankfully, it goes into an Amma sentiment zone and even a menacing Raj Bihari boss played by Pradeep Rawat can't save from becoming a bore. Eighth placed in this list is Vikram Arkadu. A key aspect of any Rajamouli film is the duality of his protagonists. 
they're either murdered and brought back to life in a new avatar or they have a past which the audience finds usually at the midpoint of the screenplay. Here he opts for a template of the 80s and 90s to express the duality where Ravi Teja plays two characters, Atali Sati and Vikram Rathor, who are lookalikes and the former goes into the place of the latter. The success of this film lies in casting Ravi Teja and squeezing dry his comic timing for the thief and his serious side to play the cop. This film is tailor-made for Ravi Teja and one could go as far as to say that there hasn't been a better marriage between an actor and the role they played in any Rajamali film since Vikram Arkudu. But the film suffers from some cringe ideas of romance and a few vulgar scenes where Rajamali dives into the ugly zone of putting women through immense torture to elevate a hero through a mythological status. Seventh placed on this list is Maria Ramana. Although heavily borrowed from the English film Our Hospitality, this is one of Rajamali's bravest films. He had just come off of the stupendous success of Magadira, which is not only a point of inflection in his filmmaking abilities, but it also changed him from being a regional filmmaker to a director the country noticed. Maryadha Ramana's protagonist, Ramu, is stuck in the house of a family that wants to kill him. The family narrates his struggles to not leave the house so he won't be killed and once he does manage to escape the house, his goal is to remain alive. This is Rajamouli's simplest premise and yet Rajamouli's penchant for bigness is visible on screen. Whether it's hundreds of car exploding as Sunil sings in existential frustration or the final stretch where Ramu is being chased by hundreds of goons and it really looks like a clipping out of Discovery Channel where a gazelle is being hunted by a pack of cheetahs. This move is a testament to Rajamouli's strength in visualizing a film's central conflict to its fullest and most masala-esque potential. The sixth placed film in this list is Sai. This is probably my most controversial opinion in this list and that is that Sai is Rajamouli's most underrated film. The film is a sports revenge drama about the protagonist of a college taking on a local gunda once he threatens to take away the college. The protagonist Prudvi, played by Nithin, is Rajamouli's weakest in terms of physical structure and the baggage the actor who plays him comes with. Until Iga of course, but we'll get to that later. Prudvi is just a college student especially the Telugu movie version of a college student. He rags juniors, takes college rivalries way too seriously and wastes time performing stunts on his bike. In Sai, compared to the villain Bhikshu Yadav, who looks like an untamed beast, Prithvi looks boyish and immature and we're not certain if good will overcome evil. This makes the difference between the protagonist and the antagonist the widest as compared to other Rajamouli's films. And Rajamouli has repeatedly stated that the one filmmaking principle that constantly runs in his head while making a film is the more ferocious the villain, the greater the hero. In no other film is the gap wider which makes the final defeat of Bhikshu Yadav that much more cathartic. But the boldest choice was to use rugby and not cricket, football or hockey and still not alienate the audience. The physicality of rugby works to the advantage of Rajamouli's school of masculinity. But to adapt it and sell it to the audience is a stroke of genius where others might not have dared to go. Without rugby, the film wouldn't seem half as engaging. Fifth in this list is Bahubali The Beginning. You knew that a Rajamali film that's going to become a household name across the country was coming. It was not a question of if, but when. And Bahubali 1 was that film. This film is a compilation of all the best tropes usually found in a Rajamali film. Which is why I think this film was better received outside the Telugu states. What felt fresh for others had a sense of familiarity for the Telugu audience. You have the superb opening sequence where Ramya Krishna walks into a gushing river with an arrow in her back to save a baby, which is Rajamali's way of keeping us hooked till we hit the flashback. Then you have the massy superhero-esque introduction with Shivaru trying to climb a mountain, justifying his superhuman strength. And then the subsequent sequence where he uproots the Shivalingam achieves many things that are a staple of Rajamouli's film. Shiva, Shiva, ya First, it lays the ground for the numerous mythological references and allusions to mythology that Rajamouli bestows upon his protagonist. Two, it has a high dosage of mother sentiment, pitting love for the mother against the devotion to God. And three, for the Telugu audience, it is a hat tip to Prabhas's legacy as the nephew of Krishnam Raju who played Bhakta Kanappa, a devotee of Shiva. Following that, there is the expected crass sequence with the woman protagonist as Shivaru tries to tame Avantika that leads to a romance between them. If there is anything that can forgive the creepiness of the sequence, it's that Rajamali convinces us that Tamanna can be a warrior. This was her most actorly part since Happy Days. All of this is in the first 30 odd minutes in the film. The introductions of each of the main characters such as Katappa, Bhallala Deva, an elderly Deva Sena, all set up a large world as if Rajamali is planning to write a third Hindu epic on par with Ramayana and Mahabharata. But this ambition is probably what lets the film down eventually and I use the term let down in comparison to the films that 
rank higher on this list only. It feels like a giant setup to a punchline that is going to come in the second part. Number 4 on this list is Magadira. Magadira is a clear point of inflection in Rajamouli's career where you can see that he was destined for box of his greatness. While his contemporaries such as Vivi Vinayak and Puri Jagannath were struggling to make a mark after seemingly hitting their peaks, Rajamouli reached new ground in this epic reincarnation love story. The film spoke about lovers Kala Bhairava played by Ram Charan and Mitra Vinda played by Kajal Agarwal who were separated 400 years ago only to be born again and face familiar obstacles. It's a story that showed Rajamouli's scale of ambition and that he demanded a bigger canvas to play with. The sequence that sets up Kala Bhairava's entry, his relationship with Mitravinda, the race with Randev Bhalla and the sequence in the desert where his horse saves him are all examples of how to create masala moments that fit into the emotional arc of a story. The flashback sequence is a textbook for all budding writers and directors of masala films. And once the fight where Kala Bhairava battles a hundred of Sher Khan's men begins, Rajamouli is in the kind of form the audience had only seen Sachin Tendulkar of the 90s. This is the film that defined the term Rajamouli style. Third in this list is RRR. This film provides the best theatrical experience compared to any other Rajamouli film in that it never lets you take your eyes off the screen. That's primarily because of seeing two big stars, NTR Jr. and Ram Charan play freedom fighters Komaram Bhim and Aluri Sita Ramaraju respectively. It's chapterized unlike other Rajamouli films and although odd at first, it was probably Rajamouli's way of telling fans of these actors to forget the stardom and the calculations of who gets how much time. He wanted the audience to only see Ramaraju and Bhim. And for the most part, he's successful. Barring the Natu Natu song, there aren't any direct fan-pleasing moments and even here, the fan-pleasing is done right. You can't help but be in awe of the footwork of the two leads. The movie moves from set piece to set piece while giving the audience the perfect dosage of emotion to balance the aggression on screen. The strong motives of its characters justify each of Rajamouli's outlandishly imagined sequences. The collective gasp followed by a cheer in the theatre post the pre-interval sequence is all that is needed as proof to understand why Rajamouli's ideas thrive on the big screen. It's easily the most outlandish masala idea I've seen executed to near perfection and that moment is meant to be savoured in theatres alone. In the hands of Rajamouli, Ramaraju and Bhim aren't historical figures but folk heroes and that is where the metre at which NTR Jr. and Ramcharan perform is perfectly in sync with the screenplay. But for all the joy of a theatre experience, I couldn't help but think of how Rajamouli, who's given Telugu cinema timeless villains such as Bhallala Deva and Kartraj, has given his weakest villain in his biggest film. But the movie promised during promotions to bring back the glory of Indian cinema and I can't help believe that it has delivered on that promise. Number 2 in this list is Bahubali The Conclusion. This is the real Bahubali film with the meat of the story and it pretty much knocks it out of the park. The stunning title sequence uses broken statues counts as a perfect recap for the first film and Rajamali wastes no time getting into the story only to never lose control. This film also heavily benefits from the chemistry between Prabhas and Anushka who take no time to sell the romance. The confrontation scenes between Shivagami and Devasena are some of the best scenes in Rajamouli's filmography and they're easily the best women characters in his films. Rajamouli sheds any doubts over his diminishing creativity with beautifully imagined sequences. There is a feeling of rushed emotions and you wish Rajamouli lingered longer on the turning and regret of Shivagami over her decision to kill Bahubali. But this film was supposed to be the punchline to the setups in Bahubali 1 and it was a knockout punch that cemented Rajamali's place in Indian film history. Number 1 in this list is Iga. Personally, I would say Iga is not just Rajamali's best film but it is also the best masala mass film to have come out of Indian cinema in my lifetime. Just the sheer audacity of the film shows that Rajamali can make a hero out of anything and anyone. It is almost the brash signature of a director sick of stars claiming that their star power alone sells films and the audience aren't ready for experimental films. A fly that showed not just the boldness of the imagination of its filmmaker, but also Rajamali demanded the audience come to a theatre. Because Iga on the small screen is not the same as watching a fly flex its muscles at the villain on the big screen that too in packed theatres. This film has one of the simplest stories of Rajamali's filmography. A young man Nani, played by Nani, is killed by Sudeep because the former is in love with a miniature artwork expert Bindu. Sudeep has his evil eye on the same woman. Nani is now reborn as a fly to take revenge on Sudeep to protect Bindu from him. Remember how Rajamali said that he loves films with a villain bigger than the hero? Here he takes that principle very seriously and makes the hero as small as heroes can get. The idea to make Bindu a miniature art expert is a sign that Rajamouli isn't taking the audience's suspension of disbelief for granted. She needs to be a miniature art expert because 
when there is a rocky esque training montage in the second half bindu becomes an accomplice here the audience finds it believable that this woman can help her fly build biceps and calves even in his most outlandish film rajamouli respects the audience and logic enough to sell us this crazy but thoroughly entertaining montage and as if to make life more challenging rajamouli doesn't let the fly talk it's mute and at first you wonder why he chose such a hard path surely a voice over or being dubbed over by an established actor could reduce the risk inherent in the film's premise but then you realize he needs the fly to be mute for two of the most whistle worthy scenes in the film first when nani the fly reveals to bindu who he really is using her tears and second during the fantastic interval sequence where the fly warns sudeep by writing i will kill you on his car's windscreen the warning from the fly is so amazing that you begin to feel sorry for the villain that's how epic ega was It's outrageous on paper but fully entertaining on screen and that to me sums up what Rajamouli's films are about. They can be accused of many things but all of that comes from a single minded determination to entertain the audience in the theater and he will do anything for that. Even make a fly the champion of mass and masala.